everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's Virtual Motor Best Practices Seminar. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the Digital Marketing Specialist for Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentations and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenters. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of each presentation. Today, we will have two separate presentations with their own Q&A sessions, so please stick around after our first presentation concludes. Additionally, a certificate of attendance, copy of the presentations, a link to the recording of this seminar, and your motor 10% discount codes will be sent to all attendees in two business days. The presenter for our first segment today is Hein Puder, Product Manager for Testing and Diagnostics. Also to assist with the question and answer session, we will have joining us Marcus Soler, PDIX Managing Director, as well as Javier Ruiz, Cable Sales Manager from Mexico and Canada, and Charles Nybeck, Applications Engineer. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today, Hein. Thank you for the introduction, Michael. As Michael mentioned, my name is Hein Pütter. I'm the Product Manager for Testing and Diagnostics, and I'm as you can hear, not from the US. I'm born in the Netherlands, but now living and working in Germany and working for Megger since 2007. Um, I am really uh, well known in the cable area and in the motor area. I am now uh, um, starting with the VLF part and also the diagnostics part, like we have equipment for. The coming presentation uh, will shortly introduce about why we need to do um, diagnostics or testing on motors then it will shortly go into the vlf testing and also its history so uh, why did vlf occur and why is it now a um, generally used test set then we go more into detail to the topic of today which is vlf testing on motors and generators then specifically the state of windings and as with some VLF test sets, you can also do some diagnostics like um, Tangus Delta measurements or dielectric loss measurements. I will also have a, a number of slides about the diagnostic measurements which you can perform using a VLF. And in the end, I will finalize with a summary and then we have our Q&A as already mentioned in the beginning. Good. Let's start with the introduction. If we look to the uh, performance of large motors and generators, then this is affected by several um, parameters. First of all, it's the choice of cooling medium, then the diameter or diameter of the of the core, and of course also the insulation thickness will have an impact on the machine. If you read through the books and documents, then uh, this performance can be measured either by a higher Power out, a higher power output or a lower operational and manufacturing cost. In this graph, you can see uh, what happens to the power output and the uh, unit mass of high voltage rotating machines. So um, starting in the year 1900, the power output per um, kilogram was relatively low. And in the year 2000, um, it's drastically increased over the years, and now it is still increasing. Um, partially, this happened as the insulation thickness um, that was very thick in the 1990s, uh, sorry, in the 1900s, and nowadays is relatively thin. So the same we have seen in, in, cable, uh, in, cable, in the cable area. So I'm uh, reflecting part of these machines to cables because there is a really nice uh, parallel to it. Also cables in the past were over-designed uh, that they were certainly not breaking down. We had the same with machines. So there was a thick insulation over the stator bars that in most cases no um, breakdown occurred. And as insulation is money, um, it needs to be reduced. So um, if you can make it thinner, thinner and cheaper, then uh, the company selling it has a higher margin. And so this is happening with machines like it is happening with cables. Cables are getting smaller and smaller. And the um, 
failure, so the, the, the allowance of failures inside the insulation is not as high compared to how it was before. So having a smaller um, insulation medium or insulation thickness over your stator windings, that will also mean that you will have a far higher electrical stress distribution on the insulation material itself on, on the newer machines. So in the past, if you had uh, 15 millimeters and you had uh, 1 kV, it was 1 kV over 15 millimeters, and now it's five times as high, so it's uh, far higher compared to what it was in the past. Then, if we look to um, rotating machines, then uh, if a breakdown occurs, this is not really what you want. So, if it's a, a small motor which is of low importance then the concern or the, the the losses will be quite low but if it if it is a machine of a hydro generator or if it's a machine of a production uh, plant within a refinery for example then the losses of production can be very very high and this is not what uh, the industry wants so they want to have a high reliability and also availability of their um, assets in service if you look to motors and generators, then uh, a research has been performed in 2018 by He Dong. And he, is, uh, he found out that if you look to large HV motors, that 60% of all failures were occurring, occurring in, the sorry, in the stator ridings of synchronized motors. So I speak 60% are in most cases, or basically electrical failures which is a really high number if you compare that to the 13% of the, of the bearings or uh, of the rotor windings. More service have been performed in the past. So one really familiar one is the, the one from Eseger in 2009. Over here, the hydro generator failures were examined and similar results were found as like He Dong. Um, in this case, it were 56, so five, 6% instead of 60%. And if you look to the state of windings, so electrical insulation was the state of windings again. Um, if you look what the reason was, then it was aging, it were internal discharges, it were loose parts, it was contamination of the winding, and also other reasons were part of the um, failures. So this is um, showing the importance that the state of windings are a critical part of your machine and um, if they have a high importance in your industry or, or in the uh, production department then it is strongly recommended to perform uh, maintenance actions on it and one of the actions maintenance actions which you can do on machines are for example high pot tests so high potential tests one possibility um, is using VLF testing. This is, uh, as you will see later on, really starting to become more available in the last decade. In the early days, it was DC and AC. Looking to VLF testing on stator windings, uh, this is dating back to the 60s already, so really a long time ago. So um, I was not even on the world. Uh, it was Bimani who did the first tests and the main reason why he did this was to have a um, similar um, stress like with power frequency. So he has seen that with DC testing, um, you did not have the same results as with power frequency testing. So therefore he was looking for, a, uh, for an alternative that allows to perform testing of um, motors and generators with relatively small size of equipment and also a lower weight of equipment if you look to the power frequency equivalent systems. So this was the main intention at that time in the 60s already um, for VLF, but this did not uh, result in a breakthrough of VLF test equipment. If you look to the major breakthrough of VLF test equipment, which is um, partially off topic for for the uh, state of windings, but the major breakthrough basically occurred uh, in the 80s. And the main reason being 
medium voltage cable testing. So back in the past for MV cables, like with um, stator, wind, uh, stator windings, DC testing was also the main way to test the isolation. Um, in the beginning, we only had paper insulated systems over there. Um, DC is not that bad. It doesn't cause any problems. However, in the end of the 70s or in the 80s, we had polymer insulated cables and um, <clears throat> also on those cables, DC tests were performed. On new cables, they did not have any problems, but if they did the same DC test on eight cable circuits, they had massive after test failures on those cables where a DC test was performed, so to speak. Uh, the main intention was to perform a assessment of the cable. They performed the DC test, it did not break down, so they were happy. Yes, cable is still in good condition. They put the cable back into service and within a couple of hours or days, the cable broke down. And this was not only once, it happened uh, really often. So what happened? As the DC testing was performed, um, depending on uh, where you are within the world, in Germany they used up to eight times the operating voltage. So if you had a um, 6 kV rated cable, they were testing it with 50 kV DC. Um, if they were testing it with 50 kV DC, that caused residual space charges to be generated. And those were induced within the insulation and they were staying within the insulation. So this is basically an, an, a battery inside your insulation defects. And if you then apply a normal AC operating voltage on top of the space charts, you have your up to eight times the operating voltage of generated space charts plus two times AC a very high voltage and the field stress was then that high that on those places where space charge was induced, uh, you had uncontrolled breakdowns. So this was the main reason why uh, there was a big breakthrough of VLF testing uh, because on MV polymer insulated cables, DC testing was simply not allowed anymore. This is not the only reason. Um, if you were looking to Polymer, insu uh, polymer insulated cables, uh, farther disadvantages have been found. So on the right hand side, you can see a, a practical example which they've done in a laboratory. So they took a real piece of cable. Then they were putting a needle in the cable. So within the insulation, they were energizing it with 50 Hertz and they had 10 samples. And all of those samples, of course, broke down because there was a needle in the cable. So that should not be there. They were applying the VLF. Uh, wave shapes, as you can see, there are several wave shapes, so sinus and cosine rectangular. They put three times the operating voltage on it. All the test objects broke down. On the last um, row, you can see that they also applied DC testing on this sample. They went up to 10 times the operating voltage, 30 minutes, had six test samples, and no breakdown occurred. So you can see that also for clean voids, cuts, or wet faults, there was no breakdown occurring when applying DC. So the breakdown principle is different if you compare DC with AC, and it's the same with um, nowadays with machines. Um, if you have high moisture within your paper layers, or if it's even really wet, then uh, with DC it will most probably not break down. If you apply a AC stress on it, let it be 50, 60 hertz, or let it be VLF, then it could well be that you break down the uh, moisturized part of the stator windings. That's the same with <clears throat> now with the, if you have um, bus bars which are fully isolated or, copper or, or stator windings which are fully isolated, then if there is a clean void inside with DC stress, you will not find it. With AC stress, there is a chance that you will break it down during the high pulse test. Looking to the VLF wave shapes, there are basically two core standardized VLF technologies available and uh, only standardized, which is sinusoidal. So that's the one which is here on the left hand side. It's a sine wave shape having a period of 0.1 Hertz, which is this normal frequency, um, meaning one period takes 10 seconds. Another 
VLF wave shape is the cosine rectangular. So it looks like a rectangular wave shape. But if you zoom in to the polarity reversal, so from either positive to negative or from negative to positive, you have a cosine shape, uh, which is caused by the inductance of the, test of the test system and the capacity of the test object. So those stresses uh, are directly comparable with power frequency because the frequency of the transition of the uh, resonance transition is the same or similar to power frequency. There's always a battle of the sexes. So um, if you look to VLF testing, there's also a battle between sinusoidal and cosine rectangular. So both have their right to be there. But if you look to stator windings, then uh, mainly uh, only VLF sinusoidal uh, test systems are used because there is limited experience available with VLF, VLF cosine rectangular test systems on stator winding testing. Um, if you look to sinusoidal, it can also be used for a tangus delta diagnostic, whereas with a cosine rectangular wave shape, this is not possible. However, on the other side, you have a leakage current, like uh, maybe what some of you know from DC testing on stator windings, then the leakage current was a really um, interesting quality parameter. You have the same with cosine rectangular. So there's still a leakage current available, which gives you an indication of the quality of your stator winding. If you look to sinusoidal, then uh, it has a lower testable capacity. So with low, if you speak of uh, capacity, then it's normally one, two, or three microfarads. So this is covering most of the uh, machines available. If you look to cosine rectangular, then there are systems available from five to 25 microfarads of testing capacity. So over there, really high loads can be tested. One of the Differences of sinusoidal compared to VLF cosine rectangular is that the PD characteristics, especially with sinusoidal, can differ uh, compared to power frequency. So this depends on the type of PD you have. If you have corona discharges, then they will have the same inception fault as with uh, power frequency. But if you have interfacial discharges, then the PD characteristics at 0.1 sinusoidal will not be the same compared to power frequency. So this is this is a point this will also be highlighted in the um, second presentation by Marcus uh, Suller. Um, he will also tell you more about uh, this phenomenon. If you look to cosine rectangular, then um, like mentioned before, the transition basically has a frequency between 20 to 300 Hertz. So it's near power frequency. And this near power frequency has uh, comparable PD characteristics uh, to power frequency itself. So over there, the PD characteristics can be compared with each other again. Some examples of test systems. So if you look on the left-hand side, then the sinusoidal test systems are normally uh, lightweight and smaller compared to the cosine rectangular test system. So on the left-hand side, you have, if you look to the RMS value, um, 44 kV RMS on the right hand side, you've got 40 kV RMS, but it's double the size and uh, double the weight, but therefore we have five times more testable capacity. In the cable world, um, over there, the um, one microfarad or the five microfarad is sometimes not enough. So on, on the left hand side, you see an example of a VLF system mounted inside a um, container and then used offshore to test the wind farm cables. Um, so the interarray cables and on the right hand side, you have an example of a, a very large machine with 25 microfarad of testable capacity, which is um, installed in New York to test the uh, loop cables at once. So over there, you can cover up to 100 kilometer of cable or 25 microfarad um, at 60 kV RMS, which is a really a high load. Good. That's so far for uh, the VLF testing and its history. So the main breakthrough is basically because of <coughs> um, cables. And as of this breakthrough and as of the uh, development performed on those VLF test sets afterwards, they are nowadays smaller and more compact and also cheaper. <coughs> 
So this was one of the reasons why um, the application of VLF testing on stator windings was not, not that popular in the uh, in the old days. So VLF test presented themselves as an interesting alternative to DC test since the voltage distribution in the insulation at VLF corresponds significantly better to operating conditions as compared with DC. Due to the lower reactive power for VLF tests, test sets compared to operating frequency, it's also an interesting alternative. And as of the higher load, it's also possible to test stator windings, including medium voltage cables. So this is an important point. So if you look to power frequency test sets, um, if you want to test from the switch out of the switch gear, um, then you have a, a good chance to test it with VLF because of this high load. If you look to power frequency test sets, if you've got a cable of uh, 100 meter going from the switch gear to the motor, uh, then the capacitive load of the 100 meter really takes a lot of your energy from the um, of your uh, transformer already, of your, of your 60 hertz tra transformer already, that it, in most cases it's not possible to test the um, stator winding anymore. In addition, if you look to cables connected to the motors, they are nowadays in most cases um, PE or polymer insulated or XLPE or EPR. And over there, uh, DC is not allowed. So therefore, um, if you want to test the state of winding with the cable connected to it, then you need to go to either VLF or power frequency. And in most cases, then only VLF is a, is a chance as of the higher capacitive load. Looking to the standardization of VLF on motors and generators, then it was first defined already in 1974 in the IEEE 433 and this standard has been upgraded in 2009 so revised and I'm expecting another revision in the coming years because now especially with the use of diagnostics uh, there is more uh, research done in the in the last decade. As in the 70s and 80s the VLF test sets compared to DC test sets were too expensive its use was very limited, so this was the same on cables. So yes, there was VLF available, but why should I test a cable with VLF if DC is also allowed and the DC test set is lighter, uh, cheaper, and it's standardized, so why should they apply it? So that's why um, also in the cable world, the DC was the main way to test cables, but nowadays if you look to uh, cable testing, it's mainly only VLF. Only in the last decade, as the prices of VLF tested decreased and also the systems became smaller, uh, the use of VLF systems for high pot testing on state of winding is increasing. Good. <clears throat> as we are talking about high pot testing, it's basically putting a voltage on your state of windings. Um, over here, extensive research has been performed in defining the correct test voltage level at VLF, 0.1 hertz compared to power frequency testing. So over here, there is a nice parallel, parallel again with the cable world. So if you look to the cables, uh, over there, you should test a newly installed cable with two times the operating voltage. And if you twist it with VLF, so two times the operating voltage power frequency, if you test it with VLF, it's three times the operating voltage. So you need a higher voltage to test with VLF compared to power frequency. If you look to power frequency testing on new stator windings, then normally this rule is applied, which is two times the operating voltage plus 1000 volt. Looking to some common uh, motors or generators, we have got 6.9 and 13.8 kV, then the test voltage with 60 Hertz on those machines is either 14.8 kV RMS or 28.6 kV RMS. So U0, uh, sorry, RMS, not peak. If we look to PLF testing, then over here they were applying a factor of 1.63 compared to power frequency, but this is then 1.63 in peak. And if you look to the RMS value, then for um, RMS, it's 1.15. So if you test it at, if you test the new machine at 14.8 kV RMS at 60 Hertz, if you multiply that at 1.15, then you have the RMS value for um, 0.1 Hertz. 
In the table shown in this slide, you see the peak values. So if you want to test a 6.9 kV motor, then if you want to test it with VLF, you need to have a VLF test set that's capable of, of having 24.1 kV peak for a 6.9 kV motor or 46.6 kV peak for a 13.8 kV motor. The factor of 1.63 is based on data for the asphalt mica insulation system. So this is the uh, where, where the factor is coming from. So as we do not only have new machines, uh, most of our machines are in service and we want to maintain them. We want to see if we can keep them into service. Uh, we also want to test those ones. Then normally not the same test voltage levels are used, but of course, lower test voltage levels are used. If you look to maintenance proof testing, um, looking to power frequency again, then they normally use 125% to 150% uh, of the rated RMS terminal voltage um, as a maintenance test voltage level. So this is to be agreed between the service contractor and the um, end customer or if you are the end customer by yourself, then you can define it by yourself. So if you want to have a higher safety margin, then you can test with a higher voltage. If the machine is less critical, then you can test maybe with a lower test voltage that, that you um, um, will not have the same uh, reliability as testing with a higher voltage, but it could be good enough for your machine already. So with um, 60 hertz, looking to a 6.9 kV motor, then the test voltage will be between 8.6 and 10.4 kV RMS. Uh, for open 100 peak testing between 14 and 70 kV peak. And if you look to 13.8 kV motors, uh, it's between 20.8, 28.2 and 33.7 kV peak. So these are the maximum test voltage levels which are recommended to be used on aged uh, motors and generators. Reflecting it again with the cable world over here, they do exactly the same. So if you have a new cable, yes, then test it with full power, with, uh, three times the operating voltage. Um, if the cable is aged, then normally lower test voltages are used. So uh, where with VLF, normally three years here is, is used for new cables. They go down to 1.7 times the operating voltage for um, aged cable circuits. Good. <clears throat> if we look to the test itself on the machine, then um, there are some precautions needed. If you want to test it with a rotor installed, uh, you can also test it without the rotor in place. In any case, if you want to test the stator windings, you need to have appropriate electrical clearing for the terminals, because otherwise you can have a flash over and then uh, you cannot properly test the machine. If you read through the IEEE uh, 400 uh, sorry, 433, so over here there's a typo error. So if you read through the IEEE 433, then <clears throat> there are further precautions to be taken based on the type of cooling mechanism you have for your machine. So there are air-cooled machines and hydrogen-cooled machines, liquid-cooled machines and oil-cooled machines. And that standard uh, nicely lists up the precautions to be taken uh, for each individual type of machine. Typically, wherever possible, that's like with um, hypo testing, um, with power frequency, it's the same with VLF, uh, you perform a test on each phase or on each binding separately. So the best is always to test on each phase separately. And there's one big reason for that, which you can read below. Um, when testing all phases at the same time, then yes, you test phase to ground, but you do not test a phase to phase. So you can have phase to phase failures and you can have phase to ground failures. And if you test, if you put the same potential on all three phases, then the voltage difference between phase uh, of state of winding one, so U and V, 
is of course zero. So there is no stress between the phases and those faults will not be recognized. So that's why it's always recommended to test phase by phase and keeping the other two phases grounded. Reflecting to cables again, um, over here, it depends on the type of cable which you have. In the past, there were paper cables, then you had belted type of cable, uh, where there were three individual cores within one cable and only having one common earth screen. And also over there, you need to test uh, phase by phase to simulate the same operating stresses like you have uh, in service, because in service, there is the voltage stress of 1.7 times between the two phases, like with stator windings. The test procedure for VLF testing is setting the correct test voltage on the VLF and then test for a minimum of 10 AC cycles. So it's a really short test of only 100 seconds. So um, comparing to the cable world where we are talking about 15 minutes up to one hour, this is a really short test. And during the testing, of course, no breakdown may occur. So um, if no breakdown occurs, everybody is happy. If a breakdown occurs, then uh, Houston, we have a problem. We need to trace where the breakdown occurred and we need to repair the machine. After testing all phases, uh, windings of the motor generator, then it's recommended to the machine for at least 15 minutes to get rid of uh, possible charges which have been uh, coming during testing within the machine. Good, so this is basically the simple um, testing part. It's the same with cables. So it's simple, a pass fail test. This really gives you already a first ID of, do I have massive failures within my, within my machine? So if it doesn't withstand this fault, then you know that the machine would most probably have broken down in service after a while. So it's better to test those faulty machines during a plant outage instead of having it during an unplanned outage. So you can save uh, a massive amount of costs by that. But still, um, it would be better to know how good or how bad your insulation is. So there is more than just only a hypo test. And that's then the diagnostical part of it. As a hypo test, no matter DC, VLF, or AC pi power frequency, it's just a simple pass fail test. No further information is gathered about the condition of the state of winding itself. There's one side mark. Um, for those of you which perform DC testing on state of windings, we do have the leakage current indication. So, yes, there is one quality indicator which can be applied, but also this, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, it is one quality indicator, but it does not mean that your machine can be properly assessed based on this leakage current only. Because with DC testing, we do not see all defects within the insulation. So only looking to the leakage currents during DC testing um, is not the proper assessment of your machine. Like with cables, um, also for motors and generators, diagnostic tests are recommended. If you look to what type of diagnostic tests are performed on stator windings, then this is IR testing, so insulation resisting testing. These are the polarization index testing, so PI, uh, which is basically the insulation resistance test for a longer time. Then we have the power factor, dielectric loss, dissipation factor, or tungus delta measurements, so four descriptions for the same type of measurement. So it depends on where you are, it could be called different, but it's all the same. So you're measuring the losses of your insulation. And in the end, which will be discussed further into detail, also the partial discharge measurement is recommended to identify specific type of defects. For the dissipation factor measurements, TD, and partial, uh, partial distance measurements at power frequency, there are IEEE standards available. So if you look to the IEEE standard 286, that's the one for tungus delta measurements or dissipation factor measurements. If you look to the IEEE standard 1434, then this is a standard describing PD measurements at power frequency on machines. If we go back to the VLF testing, then if you look to the most common commercially available VLF test sets, they do have a 
internal dielectric loss measurement. So speak, you have one unit, you can connect it to your stator winding. You can both do hypo testing with it and also a um, tongue and delta diagnostic, or if you have a PD coupler, also a PD diagnostic with the VLF test set. Apart from a tongue and delta step test, this will also allow you to perform a so-called monitored Witstam test. Um, for, to be honest, if you look to um, stator windings, as the recommended test time is only 100 seconds, um, I would rather recommend instead of doing a um, hypo test than to simply perform a tongue and delta step test and then at the maximum test fault that you do, 10 oscillations, so you take 10 tangus delta readings, and then you basically have your tangus delta test and the hypo test combined in one. This will give you far more information compared to only doing a monitored Witstam test at one voltage. Um, looking to VLF 0.1 hertz and the, uh, the dissipation factor and the losses, there are no threshold limits available yet. Um, if you look to cables, then it's the other way around. Um, with cables, there are threshold limit, limits available for 0.1 hertz, but not for power frequency, because the most common way to perform tongue and delta measurements on cables is using VLF 0.1 hertz. Um, with stator windings, it's exactly the other way around. Um, there are no threshold limits available yet. <coughs> um, for VLF 0.1 Hertz. It is known though, that if you look to the loss values that they are generally higher compared to 50 Hertz, but it's also known, and which is really important, is that the aging can be better recognized at lower frequencies compared to power frequency. It's the same with cables. Um, over there we had one specific aging phenomenon, maybe it was just water trees. Um, at power frequency, the water trees were hardly recognizable. At 0.1 Hertz, you can clearly see the water trees using a dissipation factor measurement. So with machines, same experiences have been uh, made available already that it's you can better compare phases at lower frequencies compared to uh, power frequency dissipation factor measurements. So <clears throat> going back to this slide, you can see a comparison of a machine. This is from a research performed in uh, 2019. They used the machine, they tested it with uh, power frequency, they tested it with 0.1 Hertz. And you can see over here there, yes, the tongue and delta values are higher, but it's uh, only 1% higher. Over here, we have another machine. And um, you can again see that the losses at 0.1 Hertz are higher compared to power frequency. <clears throat> also, better recognizable at power frequency, it looks like everything is one line. At 0.1 Hertz, those lines are segregating from each other already. So over here, there is already a dependency between the phases recognizable, recognizable comparing 0.1 Hertz with 50 Hertz power frequency. The classical way of representing the dissipation factor of stator windings was the tip-up value. So um, where the tip-up was calculated between the tangus delta value at operating voltage. So to speak, you have a tangus delta value of 1.2 at operating voltage. From that, you subtract the value of 20% of the operating voltage, and then you look to the rise in tangus delta. That's basically the tip-up. The higher the rise was, uh, the higher uh, departure discharges you had in your machine. So that's the second line. So when losses are being displayed as a function of the voltage, one has the chance to see where the PD starts to initiate. So this is not a tip up. This is if you put a higher voltage on a machine, you can sometimes see the voltage level where you really have high PD because then the losses will increase. Um, and the tip up is basically a, represent, a representable factor of this. Looking to the uh, machines with having a sil silicon carbide stress control coatings on the on the coils, one should know that this has an influence on the tip up. 
um, values up to two to three percent have been reported. Reflecting this to the cable world again, we have exactly the same. So if you look to specific accessories used within cables, then uh, the losses of those accessories can have a big influence on the total losses of the cable so that you should know what type of, of accessories you have. So if you've got a resistive control within your uh, terminations, then this will have an influence on your total tongue and delta values, especially for short cables. And the same you have then with the silicon garbage stress control on your stator windings. The dielectric losses and the tip-up will differ based on the type of isolation used within your machine. And especially the trending over time gives you the feedback about the condition of the stator running. So you have your uh, base value or your fingerprint value one. You retest after three to six years, then you have another value. If those values remain the same, that's a really positive sign because there are no further aging occurred. If you see a big increase in uh, losses, then you know that you have some severe aging going on in your stator winding. So that's uh, the importance of the trending over time. Exactly the same applies to paper insulated cables as well. The tip-up test, as already mentioned, is basically giving an indirect indication about the amount of PD. Um, this only for those PD defects where the repetition rate is high. If you have defects where the PD repetition rate is very low, um, such as with loose coils in the slots, then this cannot be seen uh, with a dielectric loss measurement. So this should be kept in mind when performing uh, dielectric loss measurements only. It could be that you do not see all issues. So again, a combination of a Tangus delta measurement and a PD measurement is recommended, like with cables. When performing a Tangus delta diagnosis, it's recommended uh, to perform more than two steps, so at least three or better four steps to get more information about the losses within your machine and also about the stability of the values you have. Um, EPRI has done lots of research on VLF testing and also on VLF tongue delta measurements on motors and machines. So this is a slide which I took from uh, Mr. Toman from 2017 from EPRI. His major findings of VLF tongue delta on machines were that it separates deteriorated motors with uh, so AIDS machines from good machines. So over there, it's fulfilled this function. All three VLF assessment techniques, so they were taken over from the cable world. So it's not only the tip up, but if you do a tongue delta measurements, there are more factors which you can, uh, or where you need to pay attention to. And especially uh, the latter one, which is the standard deviations or how stable are my tongue delta values per voltage level are of high importance. So that's seen in the third point. If you look to the standard deviation, then this is giving a indication about the presence of PD. So if it is stable, then so if the standard deviation is low, then low PD, so no PD. If you have a high standard deviation, then this is a typical sign of PD in your machine. And then also one of his research was then using shielded cables and non-shielded cables and over there he had surprisingly good results and further investigation was recommended to be performed. Some examples which you can see of his research where good motors had low absolute tangent delta values and tip-ups were moderate so on the left hand side you can see um, wet machines on the right hand side you can see good machines you can see that on the good machines the tangent delta values were rise uh, between 15, sorry, 50 and 200, so between 5 and 25 percent. And if you look on the left hand side, then the readings were between uh, 20 percent up to 140 percent, so far higher compared to good motors. So this already gave a good idea 
that uh, yes, with Tangus Delta, you can see uh, the aging of motors properly. Over here, another slide where we summarize it that good Tangus Delta values were from 5 to 15 percent. And if you had higher rain, uh, higher values, then this was a sign for um, aged machines. If you had decreasing values, then this is a local moisture, like we had with cables as well. So if you do a tangus delta test on a cable, if you have higher tangus delta values in the beginning, and if they lower with increasing voltage, then this is local moisture ingress. His overall conclusions were that VLF tangus delta is useful for evaluating motors and motor cable circuits. All three assessment methods should be used. Um, absolute tangus delta, the tip-up, also called delta tangus delta, and the standard deviation. The combined circuit acceptance criteria will be different from cable acceptance criteria. So um, if you have a cable connected to your machine, you should pay that into attention as well. If you look to the standard deviation, then this may be the same or nearly the same as with cables, because also with cables, we had exactly the same indication. You can have aging as of water trees or as of moisture in paper cables, then you had a low standard deviation, but still a severe aging. If your standard deviation was very high, then in most cases you had high PD or local problems, which could, could have been in that case a termination problem or a splice problem. Good summarizing, um, VLF high pot testing and dielectric loss measurements are a good alternative for DC high pot testing and AC power frequency testing, especially where size and weight matters, such as in the wind industry, or uh, if you more specifically look to the horizontally axed wind turbines, where it might be problematic to bring large and heavy machine equipment directly to your motors generators, then VLF could be a good alternative. The same applies for marine applications, then where it's sometimes hard to get machines on board, then VLF could be a good alternative. You should keep in mind that during testing, a failure can occur. So when performing testing, you must put under you must put this on under consideration. So do I have spare parts available or what happens if my machine breaks down? So don't just simply uh, run around and test all your machines and then you have breakdowns and you cannot replace them because there are no spare parts. That would not be a good idea. Please keep those things in mind. And if you look to diagnostic measurements only, you can lower the test voltage and via that, uh, be sure that you will not break down. The dielectric loss measurement is strongly recommended to in be included for both acceptance testing and maintenance testing. So why for acceptance testing to have a fingerprint and then later on for maintenance test maintenance testing to have your trending so if you do a test then please include the loss measurement as it can give you valuable information uh, the focus of the dielectric loss measurement should not only be on the tip up as mentioned in the ieee it should also be on the absolute value and also on the standard deviation so this is time stability if you want to perform proper assessment so this is basically the end of my presentation in the after the q a we will focus more on the partial discharge part but now i want to uh, conclude my presentation and give over to michael again all right thanks a lot hein as we come to the end of our first presentation, we're going to jump into our Q&A session real quick. Uh, it looks like our first question I'm going to be directing over to Javier. Uh, Javier, is there a risk to damage good insulation during the VLF test since you are applying more voltage? Uh, no. In, uh, regarding this matter, there is a nice uh, EPRI technical report in which they compared the VLF test versus the 60 hertz test. And one of the conclusions in this report is that uh, the high voltage, the, you, can, you can use the VLF test in high voltage generators 
to detect any damage in the insulation and the VLF test will not damage the healthy insulation. So uh, I think that this nice report of the EPRI addressed this question and the answer is no, no problem at all. All right, thanks Javier. And as a reminder to those who uh, arrived a little bit uh, after my introduction, we will have a second segment after this Q&A, so please stick around. Uh, second question I'll be directing over to Charles Nybeck. Uh, Charles, what's the difference between VLF uh, sinusoidal and VLF cosine? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so as Hein had stated, the continuous AC, uh, the VLF sinusoidal, is just your 0 0.1 hertz uh, sinusoid wave um, that would complete its first or first cycle or first period in 10 seconds or 12 seconds, depending 50 or, uh, or, or in 10 seconds, sorry. And whereas the cosine rectangular uh, has the fundamental wave of the 0 0.1 hertz, but during the polarity reversal mimics that of the power frequency between that 20 and 300 hertz that that Hein had said. So you're kind of achieving both the, the 0 0.1 VLF uh, frequency as well as the, the power frequency during the polarity reversal, which is particularly beneficial uh, when trying to do PD testing as well. So. All right, thank you. Uh, next over to Javier again. Um, Javier, are there break, uh, what are the breakdown voltages for the same for the VLF test and the 60 Hertz tests? Yeah, they are pretty much the same. Uh, the breakdown voltage characteristics uh, for VLF and 60 Hertz of power frequency are very similar. And indeed for the RMS values are almost identical. So yes, if you have a fault, the, the breakdown voltage will be pretty much the same. All right, thanks a lot. Next over to Hein. Uh, Hein, what are test voltages for 50 Hertz machines? The test voltages for 50 or 60 Hertz machines I've, I've, I've shown as well. Um, if you look to 50 Hertz machine, it's the same like a 60 Hertz machine. Um, it's two times the, the rated voltage, so two times U0 plus 1000 volt for new machines. If it is an eighth machine, then uh, it depends on the agreement between the end user and the tester. It's between normally between 125% and 150% of the um, face to ground voltage of the machine. All right, thank you, Hein. Uh, next question is also going to be for you. Uh, and it is, would you mind talking more about your experience in power factor testing on large stators and motors as an insulation evaluation parameter? I would say that it has been nicely um, summarized by, by Mr. Tobin. So he did lots of research. And also if you look to, to other documents from um, researchers performed in Finland, where they also were writing a thesis for ABB, they did sometimes delta diagnostics and there are really good comparisons made between um, power frequency and 0.1 hertz. And um, what I have seen is that with 0.1 hertz, especially the um, phase difference was better to rec be recognized. So you could better see that specific phases are uh, having a higher aging compared to other phases. Thank you, Hein. Additionally, uh, the next question is also for you. What kind of precautions are needed to be taken when performing VLF tests on rotating machinery when the rotator is still installed? Sorry, the rotor is still installed. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, what will happen if a rotor is, is still installed and if you don't take any precautions, then of course the rotor will turn and this is not what you want. No? So this. Uh, the precautions to be taken are nicely listed in the IEEE as well, but first of all, you should keep the rotor in place. You should short circuit the windings that uh, nothing will occur. So that's basically the main precautions to be taken. So um, it should not turn. So you should keep it from turning. All right, thank you. 
Uh, next is going to be over to Marcus. Uh, Marcus, why do you recommend to, uh, do you recommend uh, to measure in the lower frequency uh, band around the one megahertz? Um, okay. Um, hi everyone. Um, I would say this question goes into the direction of partial discharge measurement, where we go into the lower frequency to unveil. Um, PD failures from the entire winding. I will cover this question with my presentation that comes next. Ah, excellent. So then I'm going to move on to our next question over to Fine. Uh, Fine, can you test a motor and cable connected to each other but offline using VLF tests? Yes, so this is basically one of the um, advantages of using a VLF test set. Um, you can leave the cable connected uh, and uh, you can also test the cable with it. So to speak, you test the cable, you test the state of windings. If you do a tangent delta measurement, if you do PD measurements, you can see some uh, PDs from, from the terminations as well. Although they will be overlapped by the PDs from the machine itself. But <clears throat> for, the, for the hypo testing and for the tangent delta measurements, you can leave the cable connected. Uh, you need to be, pay attention that uh, the losses of the cable will be that low that you will not perform an assessment of your cable. You will really only perform an assessment of your stator winding. So the losses of the cable are in an order of magnitude lower than what we see on stator winding. So please, if you do dielectric loss measurements with your um, polymer cable connected on it, then uh, don't use that for assessment of your cable itself. It's purely only an assessment for the stator winding. I thank you, Hein. Um, additionally, uh, what is the typical service interval for high pot testing and diagnostic testing? That's um, a really good question. So this basically um, comes down to the asset manager and also to the importance of the machine. So if it's a very important machine, then what we see is that the um, intervals go down to three years if the machine is less important or totally unimportant, then no testing is performed. If it has a lower importance, then it goes up to six years. So three to six years is what we see as an, as an efforts for um, maintenance testing on machines to perform proper trending. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next question I'm gonna send over to Charles. Uh, Charles, does it make sense to perform IR testing? Uh, sure, yes, um, I mean, I. I it's, I believe that it's always uh, a good idea to perform insulation resistance testing. Um, it won't give you quite as much as information as, as the the VLF testing, but um, it'll act, it'll give you the resistance uh, of your insulation uh, that does give you insight into the condition um, and gives you quick uh, quick insight into um, whether or not the resistive uh, your, or the resistance of your insulation is still holding up well before. Uh, performing your VLF test. Thank you, Charles. If, if I may add something over here, so if you do the IR testing and if you only want to do IR testing and hypo testing, then what we would recommend is that you normally do an IR test before your hypo test, then you do your hypo test, and after that you again do an IR test, and then you can see if there are any, if there are any differences in the IR values over there. If you do not have the chance to perform any other diagnostic methods, then do IR testing, and if you want to do hypo testing, then after the hypo testing, again do the insulation resistance testing. All right, then. Uh, it looks like we have time for one more question. I'm going to send this over to Marcus. Um, Marcus, why does VLF recognize aging compared to power frequency? Um, okay, I guess this question refers to the part from Hein about uh, tongue delta measurement. Um, and I presume that it's uh, with VLF, you see the resistive losses stronger than with power frequencies. Is that right, Hein? Can you confirm? Oh. Yeah, so this is, we have the same with cables. So um, also over there, the losses are better recognized uh, as of the resistive components. That's, that's how I see it as well. Um, but it could also be uh, the polarization losses are, are different compared to power frequencies. So there are more effects 
playing a role why it's easier to recognize or i do not say it's better why it's easier to recognize uh, the uh, dielectric losses at a lower frequency compared to a higher frequency and you see the same with with transformers also over there they perform the loss measurement over a frequency spectrum and in most cases at the lower frequencies they can identify the um, moisture part of the transformer then. So if the transformer is moist, then you see that at the lower frequencies, but not at the higher frequencies. All right, thanks a lot. So it looks like that's all the time we have for our first Q&A segment. If we didn't get to your question online, we'll be trying to reach out to you offline so we can give your question the attention we need to give it. Uh, with that, we're going to be moving on to our second presentation of our BPS, and that's going to be with Marcus Solar. Uh, Marcus, are you ready to receive presenter control? Yes, please. All right. Do you see it, Michael? Okay. Yes, sir. We are good to go. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Michael, for the introduction and welcome all from Aachen, from Germany. And uh, my name is Markus Söller. I give the second presentation today about partial discharge testing on motors and a few words about my person. Um, I've started in 1997 after my studies here in Aachen uh, as an electrical engineer in the R&D team from Power Diagnostics. Since 2019, uh, Power Diagnostics is part of the MEGA group. and. Um, yeah, so uh, today I'm Managing Director of Power Diagnostics. Uh, we are based here in Aachen, close to the Belgium and uh, border and to the Netherlands. I work active in some national and international bodies and uh, specialized also in different um, areas of partial discharge measurements. During all my time, uh, from the very beginning, I um, did go out for measurements, you see here is a picture from a motor test on a cruise liner. Uh, just a side story, um, uh, this cruise liner is one of the, the third largest cruise liner on the world. We did a uh, motor test on thruster motors. Um, you have to imagine these uh, cruise liners are uh, in an island operation. You have a complete medium voltage switch gear and distribution. Um, network on this um, and um, it's very essential that all assets are maintained and serviced and um, controlled and uh, with PD measurement we did check the insulation here and I hope after my presentation you will not look that confused as uh, on the slides as I do here on this picture. Okay um, today we it's about insulation assessment of motors through PD testing. The agenda of this presentation is uh, built up in, in the following way. Uh, first, I will speak a bit about the reasons why uh, partial discharge measurement is uh, of sense and what is the uh, benefit of partial discharge testing in addition to all the other test methods. A part of that we have heard from Hein in the presentation before. I will speak about applicable standards, normative references for PD measurement on uh, rotating machines. Then I go further into measurement techniques. Um, I will show test setups for offline testing. And I will give an introduction into signal properties of partial discharges, um, calibration of the setup and how to perform and run a complete test, including uh, reporting and um, interpretation. Interpretation is then the most important part and uh, with that I will then jump over into failure examples and I show um, a few typical insulation problems on, on motors. So why are we uh, recommending partial discharge measurements on rotating machines in general? First, the offline PD measurement um, helps to assess the insulation health um, of all these kind of machines. A change in the PD pattern and the PD amplitude indicates an incipient failure. 
And finally, the, the PD pattern analysis assists with failure investigation. So you can use the partial discharge measurement as an indicator for an, um, um, an ongoing process, but also you can use it for uh, pinpointing on the, uh, on the root cause. So, and if you uh, can uh, combine these kind of PD test with other uh, measurements as loss factor measurements, what we have heard before, and also other dielectric tests with mega instruments, then uh, you, you get a great added value. Uh, by the way, this on a picture here on the, on, the, on the left, on the right is a measurement we have um, taken with our mobile test van uh, with power, um, source in, in the back, um, uh, high port, and um, here an instrument that you will see later in, in uh, some slides where I will show our instruments. Um, here we did connect to the terminals of this motor and we measured partial discharge and um, loss factors uh, during this factory test. <clears throat> Another reason, and, and you have seen this uh, diagram before in Heinz presentation, um, with, with motors above two megawatt, um, we um, have studies showing that more than two thirds of all failures are rooted to stator winding problems. Um, <clears throat> this is due to the difference in, in, the, um, in the sleeves. Um, you have with the higher ratings, you have uh, sleeve bearings. Uh, with the uh, motors below two megawatt, you've, you have uh, roller bearings. So with these motors below two megawatt, most of the failures were um, related to these problems with the bearings. But um, with higher rated motors, it's different. And when we go into the separation of these problems with the state of winding, we can also look into, um, um, into an ana analysis that was done during an uh, IEEE investigation, and it's related to hydrogen generators, but the insulation properties of stator windings uh, on, on larger generators compared to motors is uh, from the physics, um, not so much different. That's why I, I use this kind of uh, diagram as well in this presentation. So here you can see uh, again the split between insulation damages and to the right you see a lot of um, <clears throat> failures uh, related or which can be unveiled to by partial discharge measurement such as aging, um, internal discharges, uh, some loose components, um, cor uh, defective corona protection, a contamination of the winding, all these can be found by partial discharge testing. And later with my examples, you will see some photos and also the measurement results. <clears throat> so when you uh, have the uh, normal uh, um, aging of um, stator winding, the assumed life cycle uh, is up to 20 years. However, with manufacturing inefficiencies, with poor design and with improper processing, um, this can enhance the impact of the common operational uh, team stresses. So thermal, electrical, ambient and mechanical stresses um, will be um, enforced uh, by these improper um, insulation processing. So by then you find then a, a much faster developing of PD behavior and that reduce the lifetime of the insulation uh, system at all. The PD fault mechanism developing on a critical position within the winding may cause then severe problems in a couple of months. So um, the lifetime of such an insulation system um, drops down significantly. And yeah, as we know that, we, we say PD testing is an excellent tool to assess the condition of the insulation. Coming next to the uh, applicable standards and the normative reference. Um, yeah, first of all, there are no standards defining acceptance criteria for partial discharge. Um, when you go into the factory, a manufacturer of new motors, he, he will not test 
uh, a motor and say everything below 100 picocoulomb or 200 picocoulomb is good or bad, there are no standards saying that. <clears throat> so it's up to the quality manager to decide um, which acceptance level they use. <clears throat> and due to that, we have uh, quite often endless discussions between owner and manufacturer after submission of the test reports and even during the factory acceptance tests. An, an, an important difference between rotating machines and other applications is the property um, to be PD resistance versus other PD free insulation systems. So the insulation um, um, of a motor or in general of a stator winding um, shows some from the very beginning uh, internal PD due to the spaces, due to the distances, due to the uh, rotating um, um, components, uh, you have to some spaces with a higher electrical fields. So for by, by this nature, you, you find PD activities from the very beginning on a relatively low level, and that's uh, so that's very common and not very critical. So then uh, we, we find quite often these questions, how much PD is now too much PD? And how, do how to define acceptance criteria for PD resistance insulation systems? Later, when we go into the PD pattern, then you will see the difference is more um, given by the uh, different characteristic of a PD pattern than by a, a pure amplitude level. So the interpretation of the uh, partial discharge pattern becomes much more relevant than, than just a pure value. As I said, there are no applicable standards saying there, there are acceptance levels defined, um, but we have some recommendations. Uh, we find technical brochures uh, by, from IEEE, from IEC, and most of these uh, technical brochures uh, refer to the horizontal standards, uh, which is the IEC 60 to 70, which is the standard describing partial discharge measurement and, and picocoulomb measurement on lumped components. So now you will say, okay, the, a motor is for sure not a lumped component, it's a, it's a large, huge object, and uh, you are right. Um, that's why uh, this measurement in, in picocoulomb has limited um, um, value because uh, you can calibrate, and that's what we see uh, later on during calibration. You can calibrate on the, um, on the terminals only, and you cannot cal calibrate, for instance, in, within the winding where you have no access to. So it's a relative measurement. However, it is a common practice to use a picocoulomb calibration at the terminals according to IEC uh, 6270 to have a reference and a baseline measurement. <clears throat> so within these technical brochures and guidelines, you find uh, test circuits and procedures described. Some of them um, were already mentioned by Hein before. You find uh, voltage application sequences, test durations, uh, some comments on uh, which bandwidth uh, of PD detection are recommended. Finally, calibration circuits and also typical PD phenomena. So have a look into these uh, guidelines and um, technical documents. So next I will um, use a few of these measurement techniques to explain how these tests can be uh, done in practice. Um, offline PD test in, in, uh, means the motor or the generator is out of service. We apply external voltage uh, through a cable or a bus bus system um, and um, the uh, first the, the uh, bus bus system needs to be disconnected and we apply the, the high voltage uh, source uh, through a high voltage cable uh, separately. So the stator winding should be energized using an external PD free high voltage source. This can be a VLF, it can be a high port, it can be a resonant test system, but it should be PD free or the PD or disturbances produced by such a system should be filtered out so that we get a 
clean setup uh, and we can concentrate our measurement on the motor and not on some external um, pulses. The measurement condition uh, in an offline uh, measurement differs from the normal operation. Uh, here we have a cold conductor, no loads, uh, no currents. Um, this uh, is a complete different uh, situation compared to an online monitoring or online measurement. The influence of the env environmental conditions such as temperature um, and, and also the humidity um, can have an influence. <clears throat> And we have a different electrical field distribution as we test in, in single phase applied uh, mode, which, uh, which is a difference uh, compared to the uh, three phase um, field distribution in, in normal operation. Um, the measurement we do uh, uh, during an offline test can be compared with an factory um, baseline measurement. So this is recommended to get from the manufacturer of the motor or the generator a baseline measurement, a PD measurement, so that you can then later compare these um, results with your on-site offline tests. If we perform an offline tests on such a system, we combine it immediately with visual inspections, with LOX factor measurements, capacitors, measurements and also with some other dielectric tests. So it's an excellent guidance for uh, partial repairs. <clears throat> what kind of signals uh, do we try to find? Um, high frequency PD signals um, appear at its origin in a gas um, inclusion. Why is it why do we speak about gas discharge physics? The reason is that the um, permittivity is much lower in gases than in the insulation material around. So the field strength and uh, or the breakdown strength within a gas inclusion is much lower compared to solid or liquid um, insulation materials. So if there's a delamination of void or then, then we find gases inside and there that's the place where the electron avalanche starts so it's it's at its origin it's a displacement current and uh, the displacement current uh, comes with a, a rise time of um, a, a nanosecond approximately this can be calculated by the properties of nitrogen why nitrogen? 70-80% of, of air uh, consists of nitrogen and the properties of this gas um, and the rise time of, of electrons um, in these gases um, translates into a bandwidth of up to 350 megahertz. We have to consider this is at, at the origin of such a pulse. It's um, within the winding, within the insulation material. The pulse that can be measured at the outer terminals um, is um, in frequency uh, spoken, it's much lower. So we did calculations um, um, where you have to consider the different impedance within the slot compared to the impedance at the slot exit and at the overhang exit. Uh, overhang exit. Within the slot, you find 10 to 20 ohm. At the slot exit, at, in a range of 100 ohm. When you consider the, the core lengths, then uh, the uh, most of the signal, up to 80% of the uh, signal, keeps uh, trapped within the slot. So only 20% of the signal um, um, will not be reflected and is measurable at the outer terminals. Furthermore, we have dispersion, we have um, reflections, and that leads um, uh, to a residual um, pulse bandwidth at the terminals or a recommended uh, measurement uh, frequency at the terminals in the range of 10 uh, below 10 megahertz by far below 10 megahertz <clears throat> uh, this frequency uh, uh, is then a frequency that allows us to see all problems within the winding if you measure in higher modes in higher frequency far above 10 or 20 megahertz then you are limited in, in your view inside of the insulation of the winding. 
So this needs to be known that the sensitivity of the measurement drops down significantly when you go up into these higher frequencies. And this uh, basic understanding of the pulse propagation and bandwidth uh, is important for the uh, measurement and for the analysis. <clears throat> also, if you go into the interpretation of, of time domain signals, and you have to know how such a signal travels through the winding to the terminals where you put your coupling unit on. Okay, uh, let's compare pair the measurement results in these different frequencies. Here, as an example, we took measurements on one and the same asynchronous motor, 6.6 kV asynchronous motors, with internal uh, neutral connection, and we did measurements uh, at different frequency ranges. First, in the left upper corner, you see a frequency measurement uh, between 40 and 800 kilohertz, according to the IEC 260 to 70 standard. A very nice PD pattern uh, with um, well distributed um, activities. It's uh, from a thermally aged uh, winding, <clears throat> and the um, uh, calibration is correct as we are in this frequency uh, range below one megahertz. Um, and you can see that the number of PD pulses we count during a preset set time of 60 seconds is uh, with one. 0.2 million, comparably high, but that's that's typical with a 50 hertz measurement. If we go higher in frequency, let's say 2 to 20 megahertz, and we didn't change anything, we just uh, changed the measurement frequency. Um, you see, still you still see the PD activity, but the characteristic of the pattern, yeah, is a little bit different. <clears throat> And then if we go further higher, up to 20 to 200 megahertz, the interpretation becomes very um, uh, difficult and, and the number of pulses drops down significantly. Okay, this uh, you should keep in mind when selecting a PD measurement instrument and also a PD uh, frequency range for your measurement that the results can differ um, strongly if you go into different uh, areas of the spectra. <clears throat> um, yeah, a few words about the spectra. Uh, with our instruments, you can uh, record the full spectra from 10 kilohertz up to 10 megahertz. And what you see here is a measurement, again, a 6 kV uh, asynchronous motor. Um, and you see that the spectra is, is quite good up to, let's say, 5.5 megahertz maximum. <clears throat> So in this, the blue one shows the frequency components, um, shows the amplitude versus frequency, yeah, so-called spectra. And um, yeah, as high as this blue line is, as more signal you get. <clears throat> and with our instrument, we can set the center frequency, so the measurement frequency for the PD measurement to different um, positions. And we can also choose the bandwidth, um, so we can switch between narrow band and wide band measurement. This kind of frequency selective measurement helps to um, to find areas in you, in the spectra where you have a low impact of external noise, external disturbances, and a very nice signal to noise ratio to get such nice pictures and patterns as you see it here to the right. Okay, <clears throat> calibration. Yeah, as I said before, the PD measurements are relative measurements and require a calibration according to IEC 6270 if you want to show partial activity in picocoulomb or nanocoulomb. Um, today, these measurements, uh, or if, if you stay strictly to these uh, standard limitations, then you have to choose your lower frequency, corner frequency in a range between 30 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz. The upper frequency uh, should stay below um, one megahertz. And the bandwidth of your measurement device should be in a range of 100 kilohertz up to 900 kilohertz. So all frequencies between 30 kilohertz and one megahertz can be chosen if you consider um, to choose a, a bandwidth um, according to these definitions. 
With a calibration, we um, uh, inject an impulse, um, a, a calibrated impulse into the terminal, so as close as possible to the tested winding. Um, by doing so, we can simulate an, a PD pulse that comes from the um, winding and we compensate the um, overall attenuation of the test circuit. So this, need, this kind of calibration needs to be done every time you are doing a new measurement on a new motor or anything in your test setup did change. <clears throat> With the calibrator, you, you have a known magnitude um, and you can adjust then the instrument to this known value so that you get then measurements showing the correct Y scaling on the PD measurement. <clears throat> so with these uh, so-called quasi-integration, uh, as it is described in the standard, um, um, you get then very good results and all the of our PDIX instruments support this uh, measurement principle. The circuit for the PD calibration looks like that. Uh, we inject here with a pulse generator <clears throat> to the terminal under test. So in this case, it's to U1. The motor is still um, offline. We have no uh, voltage applied, otherwise our calibrator would get destroyed. The measurement uh, decoupling um, uh, coupler is connect, uh, shown here to the left in this uh, with these symbols, a capacitor and um, decoupling impedance. <clears throat> and from here it goes to the measurement device. The, in this configuration here, the, the power uh, the U um, phase is powered from the neutral side, but that can also be different. It depends on the test setup and the possibilities. So uh, by doing so, <clears throat> um, you inject here, let's say 10 nanocoulomb, as it is shown here on your uh, calibrator and on the instrument, you will then see as, uh, the same pulse and you can uh, calibrate the system accordingly. The calibration also tells you uh, more about your signal to noise ratio. That means if you have high disturbances and you cannot see the impulse generator uh, on your display of the instrument, then you have either to increase your in injected signal uh, from the calibrator or you have to uh, go to different frequencies where you have a better signal to noise ratio. This can be seen on the spectra that I did show before. Recommended offline PD test circuits are, for instance, uh, here in this configuration where you uh, have access to the neutral. Um, you can um, power um, from the um, neutral side in um, one um, phase, let's say U2, and you measure on the opposite side of the winding um, with your measurement instrument. In this configuration, you can run tests according to the IEC uh, 6034 standard. Um, you can um, apply high voltage to all three phases separately. Um, the other two phases are always grounded. <clears throat> and you, you connect then the uh, coupling capacitor, CK, to the uh, terminals under voltage, and you get then four different results. Um, three results for single phase measurement on each winding and one measurement, um, all, all windings uh, interconnected uh, and um, the measurement then um, to ground. <clears throat> um, if you, you do have an um, internal star point which cannot be uh, opened, in this case um, you can power then from the same um, side as where you have your coupling, um, decoupling uh, unit connected. Um, so here we have then uh, the configuration um, in this way that we can run these, these following tests. <clears throat> 
Um, and um, yeah, you see the, the star point is uh, short, uh, is, is, is interconnected. And for that reason, we leave uh, V1, W1 open and we test one phase after the other. <clears throat> so, and you can, can also uh, energize the, the, in this case, you energize, in fact, the, the entire winding. So what kind of measurement instruments do we um, use or can we use for these kind of tests? <clears throat> First of all, uh, for we, we have to build up a very modular system or we offer a very modular system starting with a decoupling unit. Here to the left, you see uh, different coupling capacitors of different voltage ratings. Uh, we offer coupling capacitors from 7 kV up to 14 kV, uh, 20, 25, and even higher. For motor testing, these three, four are the most common coupling capacitors. Some of them can also be permanently installed um, on, on motor terminal boxes, which is recommendable uh, in case you uh, want to perform an online measurement with your portable instrument. Alternatively to these uh, coupling units, um, which also provide then a voltage uh, signal from the down divided uh, high voltage, there's a capacitive divider built in and on the output terminal, you get the PD high frequency signal plus a superimposed um, synchronization voltage signal. Alternatively, we can use a CT um, connected to grounded leads of the motor, or um, in some cases you can also use search caps and you uh, isolate them to ground and put the CT then to the ground lead. That's also an option. Uh, we offer different pre-amplifiers. So the high frequency PD pulse signal can be amplified um, in different frequency areas to improve the signal to noise ratio. We do have pre-amplifiers uh, in the range of the IAC frequency range uh, below one megahertz, and then also different wideband amplifiers for spectrum analysis. <clears throat> the acquisition system, uh, for instance, here the ICM system that I will show later with the next slide, is our advanced partial discharge measurement system with up to 10 parallel input channels for motor testing uh, it comes with four parallel input channels and this device um, brings them on the screen the partial discharge pattern or all, all measurement results you you need for in-depth fault investigation the portable icm monitor that's uh, another instrument with multiplexer so no parallel measurement and reduced features and lower uh, price. This can also be used and can be left at site in case of uh, um, monitoring over a few days or over a few months for online testing. So the ICM system, as I said, it's, it's our advanced PD detection system and, and, and analysis tool um, can go up, can be upgraded up to uh, 10 parallel, real-time parallel input channels. This high number of channels is uh, required for transformer, power transformer testing only. For rotating machine testing, uh, we go for four um, channels maximum. Um, four channels um, makes sense if we have, um, let's say, uh, on, a, on, a, on a motor which is online and we have pre-installed couplers and a motor terminal box uh, where this coupler termination box is accessible outside. Here we can then uh, measure all three phases in parallel. With an offline test, uh, you can go with two channels only, one channel for the measurement and one channel for um, disturbance, um, rejection and so-called gating. That's a special input to uh, suppress um, external disturbance pulses from your measurement circuit. The system comes with uh, internal uh, spectrum analysis, what we have seen before uh, with different bandwidth settings. We can go into a so-called time domain analysis showing each individual PD pulse um, um, in a higher resolution. Um, this is important for analyzing the reflections and 
the different oscillations of pulses if you compare them with, with the um, measurements from the other terminals. So by doing so, you can find out the direction of the pulse within your uh, system. <clears throat> The system is suited uh, for AC testing, for VLF testing, for DC voltage, um, applied voltage test. Uh, so it offers more or less all um, common features. Um, the high resolution PD pattern is very important to be mentioned. Uh, it's 8-bit by 8-bit by 16-bit means on the x-axis versus phase, we have an 8-bit resolution. On the y-axis, we have an 8-bit resolution, and on the z-axis, a 16-bit resolution. The, the z-axis um, is the number of pulses on each individual phase amplitude position. And the number of pulses is translated into a color. So that's why you see a PRPD pattern in a two-dimensional way, and the third dimension is a color. The color uh, is uh, shown by different number of pulses. Um, it starts from gray with low number of pulses, and it changes into light red, into dark red, into yellow and blue. The different manufacturers of partial discharge measurement instrument uh, define their own uh, color coding. And uh, yeah, we did start with these kind of PD pattern display um, as one of the first commercial available uh, suppliers uh, in 1992. <clears throat> so at that time, um, Power Diagnostics was a pioneer in partial discharge measurement and the first company offering such a, an instrument with um, these colored PD pattern. Okay, um, the software, uh, or what you have seen is, is, is an instrument with um, um, hardware uh, without any display or button. So the instrument is completely computer controlled via USB or GPIB interface on or LAN network. And it uh, shows then um, on a Windows-based computer the different um, panels. Here first, the single channel uh, panel showing the PD pattern, the different settings for your measurement on the right-hand side, the different um, actual values. Um, on the left-hand side, some, some reporting and status values and many, many different displays you can select here on top. Meter display, spectrum, multi-channel display for uh, recording on, on different uh, measurement points in parallel. You can go into the spectrum analysis um, to find out uh, the best measurement frequency uh, in your setup. You can uh, run a complete uh, test um, over time with um, different voltage levels according to the standards. Uh, that's shown here. Um, it's an increase of the voltage by 20% with each uh, step. That's the blue line showing the voltage. And on the red, the red line is showing the um, PD activity in the different uh, stages. Um, that's only the amplitude or peak amplitude of PD activity. And by setting the cursor to, or uh, we have two cursor pairs. <clears throat> so one cursor pair shows the left PD pattern and the second cursor pair shows the right PD pattern. So you can analyze the PD activity at different voltage levels separately. And you can also bring that uh, uh, all the information into a report, into a printout, or into a Word document for further uh, analysis. It would uh, go too far to explain all features, functions of this software. We offer two, three days training if we sell such an instrument, but it's not not uh, not a miracle. It's um, not that difficult to get used and for sure the partial discharge pattern interpretation is something that needs experience, some training, but you find today so many literature and, and uh, good documents and, and papers, publications that will help you to do this kind of analysis on your own. So you do not always need an expert to do this pattern interpretation. And that's something I would like to show you with the examples on at the end of this uh, presentation. Yeah, we have also a statistic analysis panel and uh, that's 
from my point of view, something for researchers uh, who wants to go into detail of the characteristic of such a pattern, uh, showing skewness, kurtosis, different parameters uh, to separate PD patterns from each other and to find typical characteristics of different defects. The time domain display I did mention before, and here a few impressions of, of setups uh, when we go at site and run measurements. You see here in the back the ICM system, the measurement device, the computer uh, controlling this instrument, a second computer controlling the power source, um, in the back a coupling capacitor for a, a offline measurement and here to the right a filter blocking noise from the power source. Another picture is shown here, a similar setup with our truck. <clears throat> from our truck, uh, we, um, we get a high voltage uh, supply signal uh, to energize here in this case this stator winding. And again, control panel for the truck and for the power source, PD measurement software, PD measurement instrument, and that's it. <clears throat> Uh, we also have in our uh, service group a, a small test van. Um, this test van comes with um, high pot and small um, yeah, uh, control uh, step-up transformer. <clears throat> so with this unit, we can run tests up to 20, 30 kV. Uh, we have also a an, an special trailer for this van uh, that comes with a resonant test system with fixed frequency and um, adjustable uh, Inductance. Um, all this can be controlled from this uh, van, and we offer also this kind of control system for high pods and step up transformers and resonant uh, test systems. Here, another picture from an on site test. One of our service engineers is here, is running here and test again with the ICM system connected then to the couplers that you can maybe see here on, on top in this picture on these terminals. Okay, so the second instrument that I, oh, here, that's another maybe important um, note. Um, here we did a test in combination with a Delta 4000 from Mega. So that uh, works quite well together in combination. Um, so we can use the different power sources available in the Mega product spectra uh, together with our PD detectors. You can use a Trux, you can use a Delta, or you can use a VLF, as Hein mentioned before, to uh, perform partial discharge measurement and to power your, your um, tested motor. <clears throat> and that fits nicely together, and also the software is uh, synchronized and the reporting um, gets synchronized as well. Okay, the second instrument uh, I would like to mention today is uh, a little bit different. Uh, um, it's a so-called ICM Flex. With this instrument, uh, we um, offer partial discharge and loss factor measurement in one instrument. Um, the unit, the acquisition unit is on high voltage potential and it takes uh, the PD pulses from a decoupling unit here and also the volta voltage drop off from a capacitive divider. By doing so, we can um, get two voltages, one from the um, um, test circuit and one from the reference circuit, and we can calculate then tang delta, and um, also uh, we can record the partial discharge measurement. I see from timing I have to speed up a little bit, um, so I will not go into much into details of this instrument, just important to say that with this instrument, you can uh, do that in parallel, PD measurement and loss factor measurement in real time in parallel. And uh, this unit synchronized on, on VLF power sources, on resonant test systems, on 50 Hertz uh, or 60 Hertz high pods. So this is all given with this system. And you can export the data into different formats. You can record <clears throat> according to the um, standards, you can run a tip-up test, um, you can rec record tang delta and voltage measurement and the um, capacitance and PD values uh, during uh, this ramp-up test. You can then uh, record uh, this table and you can export this table into a special uh, report 
And here in this special uh, test, according to IEEE 286, you see then the activities versus voltage. So the different um, dots show you the um, measurement points at different voltage levels. And finally, uh, we also provide with this instrument a so-called step-by-step guide. <clears throat> that means the software uh, um, uh, guides you through the different step um, needed to, to run such a test on a motor. <clears throat> and finally, you get then the reports out of the instrument PD patterns here to the right, the record, records, the values, um, voltage, tang delta, delta tang delta, capacitance, and the IC um, partial discharge values. You can add a report on top or a predefined report that you did set up, set up in the software before, and you get the graphs all in one PDF file out of this um, instrument software. Um, how to connect the ICM Flex? Here again, the picture from the on site measurement we did in a factory of a motor manufacturer in Germany with our van. So, the power source in the back of this van, the ICM Flex with filter here connected to the motor terminals. And uh, here on top, a different picture from another measurement with the ICM Flex, which is battery powered and uh, then also Bluetooth controlled. So, the instrument as I said, on high voltage potential, can be connected via a fiber optic communication cable or via Bluetooth from your laptop. So the setup is relatively simple. You just have to connect the high voltage leads to the motor terminal, the ground connections to the ground of the motor and your, your test environment, and the high voltage leads then from your power source to the inputs. That's it. Software can be opened, you connect by Bluetooth, and then you can run your tests. The entire setup, I would say, takes about 30, uh, 30 minute, minutes maximum. Okay, finally, uh, maybe the most interesting part, uh, the, and I put that to the end, that you stay to the end. <laughs> so we have some failure examples. <clears throat> um, first, we can classify the different uh, failures on rotating machines into different categories. Uh, we have internal discharge activities, such as del delaminations, microvolts, thermal aging. Then we have uh, uh, discharges at the overhang, surface discharges by contamination, bar-to-bar -bar activity, or uh, PD due to vibrations. <clears throat> at the slot, this, in the slot, we, have, uh, we can find discharges due to wedge problems or inadequate impregnation. Then we have quite uh, important and dangerous slot exit discharges due to field grading problems. And then <clears throat> we can also see external high frequency disturbances. So that's the fifth category of activity that we can detect with our PD measurement instruments. Where do we get these kind of failures? Mainly in this data bar, we have the strongest electrical field at the corner. So this, this is, a, is a weak area. We can get delaminations at the inner conductor, at the uh, main insulation of the winding. We can have uh, delaminations within the taper layers, tape layers. We can see treeing. Um, we can also see uh, ground wall delaminations, so-called then also slot discharge, and um, also internal voids. Starting with void discharges, a fresh void in, in such an insulation layer, as you see it here in the right lower corner in this picture, in this microscopic picture, these voids um, at the very beginning um, get triggered by ionization. Uh, so the natural radiation of um, light causes um, a hit of these um, 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 molecules inside of these gases. And finally, we get then free electrons and these electrons get uh, accelerated and cause the impulse uh, that we can measure. Um, at the beginning of fresh voids, we get this as a statistical process, and then we see 
it as typical line patterns. So here in the left upper picture, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven individual voids. <clears throat> Later, when this uh, activity gets older and the motor or insulation gets aged, then we find more carbonization within these voids, and then the number of availability of free electrons rises, and then um, the uh, line pattern changes in, in a more distributed pattern. And here to the to the right, you see a, a mixture of void discharge, which goes steeper then after a while, and also surface discharge. Another defect uh, could be a, a conductor bound delamination. So a delamination close to the inner um, conductor. And here the difference is uh, what you can see in the PD pattern that it's an asymmetrical uh, partial discharge activity with the highest amplitude in the positive half cycle of the voltage shape. So in the first half, you get the highest amplitude. Here in bipolar mode, it's going down in unipolar mode measurement, it's at the same phase position, it's highest triangular activity in the first half of the voltage shape and with lower activity in the second half. Very typical PD pattern for delamination at the conductor. Next one, you have then the defect at the outer area. <clears throat> um, and here um, the PD pattern uh, looks then reversed with a higher amplitude in the negative half cycle of the voltage shape. Yeah. And again here in a bipolar pattern, highest amplitude in the negative or in the start, and it starts at the, at the zero crossing, close to the zero crossing, the PD activity starts and it's a triangular with a peak close to the zero crossing and highest amplitude in the negative half cycle of the voltage, synchronization voltage. To do this kind of interpretation, and, and you can hear that that's, it's very important to get the correct phase position. So the synchronization signal from the coupler is as important as the PD signal itself. Okay, and um, with these uh, uh, demo, uh, with these activities, with these PD activities, you get also um, quite often ozone. As long as this PD activity goes on, as more ozone uh, you get, and this is then causing additional damages. <clears throat> Next example, um, so-called thermally aged main insulation. Here it's a symmetrical pattern and that's because the uh, PD uh, activity happens here in the middle of the insulation layers and in the tape layers and it's not close to a conductor and it's not close to a grounded potential. Due to that reason we have a symmetrical pattern means um, as many impulses and activities in the first half cycle as in the second half cycle. So it takes some, some time to to do this interpretation, um, but you, you can get a feeling that, that it's not too difficult uh, with um, machine testing uh, because the number of different failures is limited. Um, and, and with doing more and more of these kind of measurements, you can find out easily uh, what kind of defect you have. Here to the right, uh, quite important to see with this high resolution uh, voltage measurement, we, we, we do with our instrument, we can also see then in this 8-bit mode, the influence of, um, um, of harmonics. <clears throat> uh, so the harmonics is strong du by dt influence the PD pattern. Okay, uh, next example, surface discharges at the end winding. Uh, here we see strong discharges uh, um, uh, dust or ozone or this white powder due to um, the ozone, um, this causes surface discharge and the surface dis discharge in the first place it looks similar but here you see the amplitude goes high in the maximum of the voltage shape. So that's a little bit different, surface discharge. The triangular is shifted in this way that the maximum is visible in the 
both half cycle in the maximum of the voltage shape. It's strongly voltage dependent <clears throat> and uh, it's due to contaminate, contaminated or moisty insulation surface. Sometimes it's also showing up when you have insufficient spacing between interfaces. So here in the right lower picture, you see this insufficient spaces, spacing and then this white powder here in, in, in this uh, area. <clears throat> Finally, uh, I would like to show you typical slot exit PD activity. It's a very initial, um, um, moment uh, and that's shown here with this um, A uh, marker here in the right upper corner. A uh, is, a, is a sign for an initial activity uh, when the um, semiconductive pay, uh, uh, tape is, is uh, just partly destroyed. In this moment you get this uh, asymmetrical pattern um, with higher um, predominance in the um, negative half cycle of the voltage. And um, you see here, you get then uh, surface discharges um, between uh, semicon uh, tape and, and then uh, the um, um, yeah, inner part. And later, when we go then to the next stage of the same activity, so same activity, let's say a few months or a year later, can develop um, in, in a way that the tape here is eaten up completely and um, then it changes into stage B. Uh, the PD pattern is changing because here we have now floating potentials. So the pressure finger here discharges versus the conductor directly. And this floating activity has an impact on the uh, properties or the characteristics of the PD pattern. So it's then a flat amplitude with multiple times higher in amplitude compared to the previous stage. So here we are talking about 100, 200 nanocoulomb compared to a few nanocoulomb at the initial stage. So to summarize my presentation, <clears throat> Stator winding insulation systems are PD resistant and widely tolerate PD activity for several years of operation without being the root cause of the failure. The dielectric measurements are as important as monitoring of vibrations. Partial detection on rotating machinery is a matter of trending on comparing actual results with available reference data. There are currently no acceptance criteria defined. That's what I showed in the different um, applicable standards or non-availability of applicable standards. So sufficient care must be taken with the bandwidth selection, calibration procedure is important, and the correct selection of recommended measurement circuits is important. Finally, the analysis of the phase without partial discharge pattern provides essential information about the ongoing type of partial discharge and the concerned location. And so with offline measurements, serve the offline measurement itself serves as an in-depth verification after manufacturing, during the first months of operation, and during major maintenance outages. Moreover, they are an excellent tool to be used for partial repairs. Okay, um, that's this for now. I thank you for your attention and hope all are still there for our final Q&A session. I will now hand over again to Michael and we'll see if we have some questions coming up. Excellent. Thank you, Marcus. So at this time, the presentation portion of our second segment has officially concluded. We'll now take a couple of minutes to answer as many of your questions as possible. If you have any questions, please submit them now into the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. For those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a brief survey should pop up on the screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon our future webinars. On the survey, there's a field where you can also request a demo or a quote of any mega products. A copy of these presentations, certificate of attendance, the motor product discount code, and a link to the video recording of the seminar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. You can also view video recordings of previous webinars on our website 
at us.megar.com slash webinars. And be sure to join us for power quality applications, measurements, and analysis on September 30th. So let's jump into your questions. The first one I have, I'm going to be directing to Charles Nybeck. Charles, what would you recommend uh, for either permanent online monitoring or periodic offline PD testing? Thanks, Michael. That's a great question. Um, and hi, next, or, I mean, sorry, Marcus actually touched on that right as his last summary on his bullet point. And it's really a matter of, of each has their own advantage and disadvantage. Um, as he had mentioned um, on his last summary point, if you're doing offline testing, this can serve for a more in-depth analysis of the of the asset. Um, this would allow you to control your voltage. You could stress it if, if you chose. You could also gives you the ability to record your inception voltage, which is the point at which you start to see partial discharge taking place and the extinction voltage, which is when you as you're backing back down, the point at which the partial discharge uh, ceases to take place. Um, and both of these are important because as these as these voltages go down and it starts give you, giving you um, an indication or of, of deteriorating insulation system. Now, permanent online monitoring or even um, you can per, you could also do periodic online monitoring uh, through permanent installation of couplers. But this gives you the ability, obviously, if you have a critical asset or if you're doing periodic uh, measurements and you determine that you have an asset that's maybe um, questionable, you can uh, permanently install your couplers and, and do permanent online monitoring. Uh, and you can set a, an alarm threshold value and it allows you to keep a closer eye on it. Um, you know, there's products out there uh, that, we, that um, you don't even have to be on site. You can check it through, you know, like a web-based portal um, and check on your asset so uh, that you won't even have to show up. So you have more frequent testing uh, and so on. So it kind of really depends on the situation and what you want out of it and, and really how critical that asset is um, as to what I would recommend or what would be recommended um, mode of, of testing. But again, each of them have their, uh, their, um, their advantages and disadvantages, if you will. Thank you, Charles. Next question, I'm going to send over to Marcus. Uh, Marcus, do you recommend partial discharge testing of green coils for installation uh, into a motor core? Um, yeah, we have, uh, yeah, I'm still on mute. Okay. Um, yeah, we did test on, on single um, bars uh, as well. Um, I know from manufacturers, they do so as quality tests before they put it into the uh, uh, motor. And uh, it's an additional value to find out if, if uh, your production process or processing is done uh, correctly um, and you can prevent uh, uh, in this way failures at an early stage. Yeah. So the answer is yes, I would recommend, yeah. All right, thank you, Marcus. Uh, next question is over to Charles. Uh, Charles, what voltages are you using to define uh, medium voltage and high voltage? Uh, Charles, we might have you on mute there. Definitely was on mute. Thank good, good looking out, Michael. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so I'll probably need Marcus to to back me up on what he was defining as medium and high voltage. But by IEC, uh, medium voltage is anywhere between one k one and thirty five kV, whereas high voltage can be thirty five to two thirty kV. Um, now, for trans, if you're looking at generation and transmission, you know, medium can be 2 kV to 8 kV, where distribution can be 4 to 25, um, and your substation could be 35 to 69, and high voltage at that point for transmission could be 69 kV to 230. But I guess, Marcus, what if you want to give a little bit more clarification as to what you were using for medium and high voltage? Yeah, I would see it similar as you, you do. Um... From my understanding, or by definition, everything above 1 kV is named high voltage, just by definition, but uh, uh, it's very common to use medium voltage for everything uh, in the distribution class um, network. Um, yeah, so I, I would follow your, your, your statement. All right, thank you very much. Next is over to Marcus again. 
uh, how do you filter external disturbances from internal PD? Yeah, different ways. Um, first of all, <clears throat> we can use a, a, a filter between a power source and um, decoupling capacitor. Uh, that's a T filter with, with an uh, filter second order um, LCL. Um, that's one way. Um, this kind of filter blocks all line coupled um, disturbances. Uh, second way is to use a so-called gating input. With this gating input, we can um, trigger on um, disturbance signals from the environment coupling over the ground. <clears throat> Uh, let's say uh, inverter signals, uh, crane movements um, producing disturbance signals. Um, these we can pick up from ground. We can bring these uh, disturbance signals into a separate input of the instrument and the electronic circuit separates these disturbances from the measurement pass. And the third uh, way is to use spectrum analysis. That means that we choose uh, measurement frequencies where such disturbances uh, do not show up. Um, and for each setup, we <clears throat> have to decide which uh, is best. So for monitoring, we go for spectrum analysis and choosing then a proper frequency uh, range. Then. All right, thanks, Marcus. Uh, next is over to Hein. When a cable is connected to the machine, can you also assess the termination? That is a good question and is not that simple to answer but um, what we have seen in the presentation before from Marcus is that if you look to the PD amplitudes from PD coming from the machine we are talking about nanocoulomb or high nanocoulomb brains and if the PD values are that high then if you only have one PD coupler um, and then you will not see that there was also PD within the terminations because those levels are normally uh, lower than 1,000 picocoulombs. So those ones will not be seen. Still, uh, there are other ways to couple outputs or discharges during testing. So if you've got a 50 hertz test and if you are energizing to your motor, if the terminations are um, a couple of meters away from your uh, motor, so 10 to 20 meters away from your motor, then you can use uh, so-called UHF measurements which are local measurements and via that you have a way to also um, assess if determinations have PD during your <clears throat> normal PD test. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next is back over to Charles. Uh, Charles, is there any kind of power source suitable for PD testing on motors? Uh, sure. Yeah, Marcus actually covered this um, and several of them. Uh, and so you can use uh, power frequency, um, you know, like a fixed frequency resonant test system or high pot um, as, it, you know, if it's PD free or, or making sure to use the filters uh, that Marcus had mentioned. Um, we can use high voltage filters uh, to filter out any noise or, or harmonics from this, the, the power, the supply uh, but also you can use vlf test sets um and and as marcus said if you have a a test set that maybe is a power factor test set or a substation uh test set that has the ability to use um uh like a manual control on its on its power supply or high voltage supply you could use that as well um so it can it just matters um what you use um the only thing difference is it is going to be the the PRPD pattern depending on on if you choose a VLF source or a 60 hertz source, uh, but nonetheless both of them um, would be capable of doing partial discharge testing on on uh, motors. All right, thank you, Charles. Uh, next is to Marcus. Uh, as you are a PD expert and as nothing is standardized, what would you recommend for PD threshold values? Yeah, uh, threshold values are, from my point of view, not less important than the characteristic of a PD pattern. So when we take a baseline measurement in the factory with a new machine or new motor or a repaired motor, this baseline measurement is the first indication if there is a if there's normal PD or if, if there's a severe problem. 
a severe problem would be a, a PD activity, uh, as I've shown in, in my failure examples, um, delamination on the, on the conductor or delamination at the ground wall, slot exit discharge, overhang discharge. That, that's something I would consider as, as critical. If, if it's a thermally aged generator, for instance, uh, where you have multiple activities um, over years, um, I would check the trending. That, that's more interesting uh, to see how PD develops from one year to the next, or if it's on a higher PD level, then I would uh, reduce the testing period, let's say from months to months or even shorter to find out if this PD develops, if the characteristic of the PD pattern changes, and then uh, subsequently also then the uh, PD amplitude goes up. That would be more um, a more valid <clears throat> identifier um, than just checking the amplitude in millivolt or in, in, in picocoulomb. All right, thank you. Uh, next is back over to Charles. Uh, can the spectrum analysis also be used to identify multiple defects within the machine? <clears throat> uh, maybe inadvertently. Um, as as Marcus had said, um, the the spectrum analysis is actually used uh, to choose the measuring bandwidth that you want to, or the measuring frequencies that you would like to choose. Um, it gives you the option of looking at the full spectrum and and giving you the the best signal to noise ratio as you can choose um, that frequency spectrum or that frequency band rather that um, that may not have as much noise. Um, again, allowing you to get that signal to noise ratio. So it's not really that the spectrum analysis itself would identify multiple defects, but it would allow you to have a good enough signal to noise ratio to identify um, or get the best measurement you can to identify defects within your machine. Maybe, maybe uh, or may I can add uh, a few words to that. Um, with a different, uh, with one PD pattern, you can see multiple PD defects in one pattern. Um, and uh, if you go into time domain, you can also do this kind of analysis of, of the steepness of the rising pulse to find out if it comes from deeper inside of the winding or more from the external slot exit. Uh, so there are multiple ways. Spectrum is one way, uh, time domain analysis, and more, most important, the PD pattern interpretation. Uh, in this way, you can find different defects and um, All right. Uh, since you're here, Marcus, uh, can PDIX PD instrument detect end winding vibration? Um, indirectly, indirectly. So uh, we can, uh, with the vibration, um, uh, we will for sure then uh, see an influence on the electrical field distribution, and that can lead to uh, earlier in. in Inception voltage of partial discharge, and the vibration itself influence and also the um, PD pattern characteristics. So these kind of vibrations um, show up uh, in a way in, in the characteristic of the pattern. And yeah, it's an I would say indirectly uh, we, we we can get some indication that there's a vibration going on. All right. Thanks. Uh, additionally, Marcus, how often should you monitor PD for periodic online monitoring to assess state or winding insulation? Yeah, as, as mentioned before, I, I would not say strictly every every month or every uh, three months you should monitor or measure the uh, the asset. You should <clears throat> you should make it dependent on the condition. So if the uh, uh, if you assess the uh, insulation health uh, and you find um, no weak areas, then you can say the next measurement is done in a year. If you find some critical um, activities, then I would repeat the measurement uh, maybe two weeks later or four weeks later to see if, if it's um, changing or, or going on. And if it's a, an important asset, then I would also recommend to put per periodic online monitoring a uh, system on this unit to to measure uh, by remote uh, the activity, and that's um, 
then maybe the best way to make sure that you do not miss any any um, change in the um, criticality. All right, thanks. Uh, next, back over to Charles. With all the work that has been done, do you have any idea why there are no standards for PD values? Uh, sure, I'll give a shot and then um, maybe have Marcus say a few things on that. But basically, it's due to the fact that rotating machines installation systems are designed to be partial discharge resistant, um, where many other high voltage assets are, are thought to be or, or designed to be partial discharge uh, free, meaning that there's a typically always going to be partial discharge within your rotating machine. And as Marcus has stated um, in a previous question, that it's not necessarily the magnitude of the discharge in which you're interested in, as that can change based on the defect and, and many other things, but, but more or less the, the progression as well as the phase resolve partial discharge pattern. Um, and it's difficult to create a standard based on that criteria. So Marcus, I don't know if you want to add a couple more words. Oh, it's fine. Good. No. All right. Good deal. I noticed we've neglected Hein, and so we have time for one more question, so I will throw that over to him. Can you use the acoustic and UHF accessories for motor and generator PD detection to localize exactly where the PD is coming from? That's a good question. Um, I will start with UHF. Um, like mentioned before with UHF, if there is a sensor locally attached to a cable termination, then you know it's coming from a cable termination. But if you look to a um, motor or generator, then the UHF will not be able to localize the PD. You can either use an antenna or you can use other couplers, but you will not be able to localize uh, a specific pattern, uh, sorry, the, the PD. If you look to the acoustics, then um, it depends. So are the, uh, do you have access to the stator winding? So do you directly have visible access with your um, microphone to the PD sources? And that's, if, if yes, then there is a chance to, to localize PD. If not, then also acoustics will not be a possibility. So you need to have large motors where the rotor has been taken out. Uh, then you have chances to find PD. If it's on the end winding, then the rotor can stay inside, of course, but still um, you need to have access to the uh, PD source. If there is no direct access, then you can also not pinpoint it. Uh, Marcus, what do you say, with, with, with especially with regards yeah. to the UHF? Yeah, so with the, uh, first with the acoustic, uh, you need uh, at least an electrical trigger if you um, apply acoustic sensors uh, on a stator to get a precise trigger um, for the acoustic measurement if you just apply acoustic sensors you, you are so looking into all kind of uh, acoustic activities vibration and so on and it's not related uh, to partial discharge um, so I, I would not consider that as a good solution for uh, pinpointing PD the same with UHF what you have seen from my explanations uh, regarding uh, pulse um, content or frequencies of uh, PD pulses from machines. Uh, it drops down significantly um, uh, the frequency content in the pulse that we measure on the terminals. It goes down uh, quickly down below 10, 20 megahertz. And UHF starts from some 100 megahertz, 300 megahertz upwards. So UHF at all, I would not consider as as useful or uh, meaningful for PD detection on, on rotating machines at all. We, we use UHF measurement in, in uh, gas insulated switch gear where you have SF6 gas and the rise time of these pulses are in the range of picoseconds. Here you, you find activities uh, in, in a range from a few hundred megahertz up to 1.8 gigahertz. But, uh, these are radiated electromagnetic pulses in a GIS chamber, which are detected uh, by special capacitive sensors. Um, and here on our generator motor, we speak of electric pulses, not electromagnetic pulses. Electric pulses coupled over via the terminals, via the impedance of the windings to the, um, through the uh, impedance network to the coupling capacitors. And these signals are detectable in a, in a range of below 
10 megahertz and yeah i would not bring that in combination here uhf and yeah all right then it looks like that's all the time we have for our q a session uh we apologize if we didn't get to your questions today but we will be following up with you offline the following week uh once more a copy of the presentations certificate of attendance the motor product discount code similar to the one that's up on the screen now will be sent out in two business days along with a link to the video recording of our seminar i'd like to thank you all for attending if you could please remember to answer our survey the survey will also include a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you're interested but i'd like to thank you all once again for attending and i hope you all have a terrific week